Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Today's lesson for this week is Joseph, Master of Dreams. We have Elisa and David here teaching today, along with myself. Mm -hmm. um, before we begin, though, let's invite the most important person for the Sabbath school lesson. That's the Holy Spirit. David, could you pray for us, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Our loving Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, we are just thankful that we are here today. You brought us here safely on the Sabbath morning. I pray that you be with us as we speak and discuss your word. Let it be your word from the Holy Spirit. Lord, we are learning about you and your love and your grace. And we're learning about our imperfections and how you love us so much that you're working around the clock to make everything better. You're calling us to be your family again. Lord, we're just so thankful for that. Be with the panel. Give us extra blessings so that we can say and do the things that you want us to do. Be with the people that will be listening to this broadcast that they may be filled with the Holy Spirit and understand what the message you are giving for their lives, Lord. We just want to thank you, Lord, and express all our gratitudes towards you for loving us so much. There's nothing that we have that is worth saving, but in your eyes, Lord, we are so precious. And for that reason, we are grateful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, so this week's lesson, we're going to start just reviewing last week. We left off with the lesson last week with Jacob becoming Israel. The transformation of truly repenting of all of his sin and surrendering to God completely. That would be that wrestling with the angel, which was really Jesus. Escaping from Laban, reconciled with Esau, and finally at peace in the land excluding that little incident with Shechem and Dina. But there we begin to see the most dangerous threat of all, the threat from within. The patriarch Israel, though reconciled with God, still has a few flaws. The biggest being his love and adoration of Joseph, the child that had been born to him in his old age. Joseph, the son who tells on his other siblings when they do wrong. Joseph, the son who wears the tunic of many colors, the son who Jacob apparently intends to give the right of the firstborn to. Joseph, the one who has prophetic dreams about ruling over his brothers and tells them. Even sharing the dream about his father, mother, and brothers all bowing down to him. Probably not the best move. As the memory verse says, in Genesis 37, 19, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. But if we take the literal translation, it would be better translated as, behold, this master of dreams comes. But they say it in not the nicest way. Kind of like that person that always bosses you around or bullies you and, and gives you orders and you say, yes, your majesty, to them. It's kind of more sarcasm. And we see the culmination of the hatred of his brothers have for him as they sell him as a slave. At least they did not commit murder as they originally planned. God's providence and action. In one moment, a life can be altered forever. So what carried him through this? What carried Joseph through the slavery, the imprisonment, all these things? Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 213, then his thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear him. Often in his father's tent, he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home, an exile and a fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promises to Jacob and how they had been fulfilled, how in the hour of need, the angels of God had come to instruct, comfort, and protect him. And he had learned of the love of God and providing for men a redeemer. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord. And he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. Kind of the same at Bethel when Jacob promised to give himself completely to God. Absolutely. So once this happened, 
everything got better, right? Oh, only if. For 10 years, Joseph prospers in Potiphar's house at least. And Potiphar notices that he's blessed and puts everything under his control. Amid all the idolatry and false worship, Joseph clings to his God. Even when Potiphar's wife tries to lie with him, Joseph proclaims, how could I do this great evil and sin against God? Now comes the prison sentence, all for being true to God. Another 10 years pass, 20 total before Joseph is promoted by Pharaoh. Joseph is in more chapters in Genesis than any other patriarch. Chapters 37 through 50. And in the next three weeks, we will study in depth the life of Joseph and how he, God had led him. But you know the real star of the final three lessons, right? God, God. himself. Yeah. Of course. Mm-hmm. Throughout this entire lesson, we see God's providence. Do you believe that anything happens without God allowing it? Not making it happen, but allowing it. Does God ever allow bad things to happen and use that to do good? This lesson is proof of it. An example outside of this lesson would be the 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah. And Daniel knew the 70 years was almost up for Israel to return back to their homeland from exile. He confessed his sin and the sin of Israel itself. And when Gabriel visits him, and in Daniel 10, 13, he says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, that would be Satan, was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now we know who Michael is from previous lessons. He's the pre-incarnate Jesus. And Gabriel has come to contend with the king of Persia for 21 days and basically got nowhere. He could not prevail. It literally took Michael to make it happen. Isn't it comforting to know that God's word always comes true, even if he has to personally come down and see to it? Isaiah 55, 11 says, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. And this is God speaking. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. It might take a while, We will probably have to wait longer than we like, but God's word and promises never fail. I would like us all to remember that as we read today's lesson. Elisa, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, Family Troubles? None of us have ever had family troubles, right? No, never any dynamics. Well, I don't know, as I read through this, I I can certainly think of a few times perhaps where, you know, my my family or, or those I, others I knew um, resembled some of this, but, but not to the extent, for sure. So we're going to start by reading Genesis 37, 1 to 11. And the text reads, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, also could be considered as a sojourner or temporary resident, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah, who was Rachel's maidservant, and the sons of Zilpah, who was Leah's maidservant, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of this to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So let's just pause there and reflect a minute. So in verse 1, we learn that Jacob had settled in this land where previously his father Isaac was a stranger or a sojourner. We often see this in our own country as, you know, immigrants come from other countries and they, they, they come and they make their resident here. It's, it's strange to them. It's not, it's not like it was from their homeland. And there's many things that they just, you know, don't feel comfortable in because 
it's, it's just a different culture in different country. However, their children and children's ch children settle in and become part of um, the country. And so we see this happening here um, with Jacob settling into the land. And then in verse 2 to 4, we read about the controversy and strife that's within the family. So we have different mothers, and the mothers have a different status. Some are the rightful wives, some are maidservants. There's favoritism. Uh, Rachel had um, been the chosen wife, if you'll re recall. That was the one that Jacob had originally selected um, before he was uh, married to Leah uh, wrongfully. And um, it's still this, he's, she's still the favorite, and so Joseph is a favorite son. And Jacob also makes Joseph a tunic similar to a prince's garment. So perhaps this maybe in some way indicated Jacob's intent to elevate Joseph, um, who's Rachel's firstborn son, to the status of firstborn. And so, so I'm sure the pit brothers picked up on this, and this didn't help out with, with the situation. The, and then um, we also see that the family division was made more severe by the fact that Joseph brings back these reports of his brother's wrongdoings to the father. So, so this is all going on in this family. Let's pick up on verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. So pausing there and reflecting, the text doesn't reveal Joseph's intent on telling his brother the dream, but regardless of the intent, it did deepen the wedge between Joseph and his brothers. Their jealousy and hatred was very intense. The dream did seem to indicate that they would bow down to this brother that they hated, and that was something they simply couldn't tolerate. So taking a look at verse 9, we read, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So reflecting on this, we see that the text shows that there, this wasn't some random one-off dream that, that we may dream from time to time. This is a dream that's repeated. And even though some of the elements are different, the theme that Joseph's family would bow down to him and in other words, Joseph would be in a position of rulership over them, was consistent in the dreams. So even though Jacob rebukes Joseph for telling his dream, the text said he kept the matter in mind. Makes me think about when Mary was told by the angel that she was going to have a baby, and she kept that matter in mind, right? They ponder these things. So Jacob knew that this was perhaps something going on that he didn't quite understand. He sensed that they were a prophetic message from God. And other texts explain that this is a pattern that God indeed follows to reveal to his people what he is about to do. So if we would look at Genesis 41, 32, that reads, And the dream was repeated by Pharaoh twice, because a thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. So that's a pattern that God has used. So while Jacob and his family couldn't understand these things at the time, history and the scriptures reveal that God did indeed order the events. The family structure and positions of authority to serve his ultimate purpose and correct past wrongs. In Genesis 42.6, we read, 
Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And 1 Chronicles 5, 1 and 2 says, because Reuben, the firstborn, defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. And verse 2 says, the birthright or right of the firstborn was given to Joseph. So we know that this actually happened. So pride, jealousy, covetousness, while so prevalent in society and families, even the church and amongst God's people are serious sins that cause grievous pain and suffering in our relationships. Jesus addressed this human condition and called us to be a servant of others rather than to promote our own desires at the expense of others. In Matthew 20, 25 to 27, we read, speaking to the disciples, Jesus said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his ransom for many. So reflecting on the root of this discontent and strife in Jacob's family, Ellen, Ellen White writes um, a few passages and, that I'll reflect on here. She says, The sin of Jacob, the train of events to which it led, had not failed to exert an influence for evil, an influence that revealed its bitter fruit in the character and life of his sons. As these sons arrived at manhood, they developed serious faults. The results of polygamy were manifest in the household. This terrible evil tends to dry up the very springs of love and its influence weakens the most sacred ties. The jealousy of several mothers had embittered the family relation and the children had grown up contentious and impatient of control and the father's life was darkened with anxiety and grief. There was, however, a widely different character, the elder son of Rachel, Joseph, whose rare personal beauty seemed but to reflect an inward beauty of mind and heart. Pure, active, and joyous, the lad gave evidence also of moral earnestness and firmness. He listened to his father's instruction and loved to obey God. The qualities that afterward distinguished him in Egypt, gentleness, fidelity, and truthfulness were already manifest in his daily life. So we, we see that God was preparing Joseph in that character development for what was to come further on in his life. Go ahead and pass it on to you, my friend. All right, that was... Uh... You said something that's so interesting, that the dream was repeated. And we noticed that in this um, Joseph story, there are repeated dreams, which means that God is going to act and possibly within the same generation. And that's what we see with Pharaoh, with uh, the butler and the baker. Mm -hmm. And we also see that with Joseph. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing yep. that up. Mm -hmm. So the attack on Joseph is the Monday's lesson. It, you know, this lesson, again, Byron mentioned it before, that it's God is doing everything. It is all God yeah, doing everything here, allowing things and change, you know, helping us to be part of his family. See, what happens when envy, hate, is not checked at its first birth? It leads to physical violence. Happened in heaven with Satan. Uh -huh. God had to recreate the earth because of that in the flood, Noah's flood. And again, because in our heart, we are, um, in our core, we are selfish. Uh, this thing always, always needs to be under checked. And that is why God said that he, Jesus said this, that is so interesting. In, um, in uh, John 5, 17, Jesus answered and said, My father, my father has been um, working until now, and I have been working. So God is on the move all the time to help us be his sons and daughters. And that is really the story. So, how, how, you know, Jesus mentioned this uh, similar 
uh, para event that Joseph went through in the parable of wicked vine dresser. If you go to Matthew 21, um, uh, chapter 21, verse 38 to 39, you will see, uh, and we can compare that. It says, but when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is their heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, uh, we already read this, but let's reread, it, reread this. Genesis 37, 18 to 20. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. They were worried about the inheritance, their inheritance, and they wanted to destroy Joseph for that. Actually, the brothers, their real fight was against their father, Jacob, and that's what it is. So let's, let me tell you the story really quickly because it's a, it's a long story. But here, um, Joseph's brothers dis, uh, goes to feed the flock, and Joseph... Um, and Jacob tells them to go to um, Sheshem. But then they moved on to Dothan. And so uh, Jacob tells Joseph, you know what? We haven't heard from your brothers. Why don't you go and check on them? So he goes. It's a 50-mile journey. Think about it. He goes and he can't find anybody in Sheshem. So he's wondering. And guess what? Some man tells him, oh, they went to Dothan, which is about 15 miles from where he was. Now, I always wonder, what is this man, you know, some man. It has to be divine intervention, right? Some man. And so then he goes, and as he's coming, his brothers see him, he sees this coat that he was wearing. That coat was like a symbol of status, like somebody loves you. You are the beloved of your dad. And that, even. Prince? Prince. Or? Prince. It's a prince coat. Right. So, um, and so here Joseph comes in, and I was surprised that Jacob actually wanted to send him all alone as a 17-year-old with this long journey that he was going to make to his bro- yeah, brother. So initially I thought maybe Joseph you know, spoiled him a little bit, but it doesn't seem like it to me. But regardless, so they see him, and then they start their jealousy that they haven't checked. You know, they haven't controlled it. Now it came to pass, and they see an opportunity. And, you know, many, uh, in the, they're kind of torn. I know what um, uh, Mrs. Ellen White says in the spirit of uh, prophecy, said that, you know, as they are discussing this, but some of them, the brothers, were ill, ill at ease. They did not feel the satisfaction they had anticipated from their revenge. So wh- what happens? Well, they, when he comes and Jacob looks at them, and right away, he sees that there is no favoritism. And, you know, they, they, he's not their favorite. He's in fact, in he's, he's in trouble. He's hated. You know, and the funny thing is, Joseph and Jacob never realized it. It was somewhat concealed from them, this hatred. And now it's there, and there's no way to get out of this. But God, again, does his work. Through Reuben, he tells, uh, you know, Reuben tells them, don't kill him. We should not shed blood, innocent blood. Uh, and then he had Judah... Later on, when Reuben leaves, Judah comes up with a plan and sells um, Joseph. And he says, you know, um, well, we, we just sell him because we don't want to be part of that bloodshed. You see, the thing about back in the days is that it is better for somebody like Joseph, who is loved and cherished, to be dead than to be s- sold as a slave. It was a w- far worse mm-hmm. than death to Joseph. Uh, and, you know, in their mind, the brothers were thinking, we'll never see him again. He's dead to us, right? Mm-hmm. And, and look, look what happens. So this is, this is such an amazing story here because this is a lesson for us because we are a family in this world. God created Adam and Eve to be part of his family, but we are dysfunctional family. And this is where we see that when we are dysfunctional and we do not keep that Ten Commandments as our mirror, as our guide, then we cannot check ourselves. And when we don't check ourselves with that Ten Commandments, guess what? Our internal feelings of mm-hmm. hatred, all that wickedness that God said that we have as a child, 
will become expressed in our action, and that's what we don't want. Mrs. Ellen White says in our High Calling, page 234, envy and jealousy are diseases which disorder all the faculties of being. They originated with Satan in paradise. Those who listen to Satan's voice will demerit others and will misrepresent and falsify in order to build up themselves. But nothing that defiles can enter and uh, enter heaven. And unless those who cherish the spirit are changed, they can never enter in heaven. For they would criticize the angels. They would envy others' crowns. They would not know what to talk of unless they could bring up the imperfections and errors of others. You see, we all have this. We must check it. And we have to check it right now because Jesus is coming soon. I like what Paul uh, in Acts of the Apostles 7-9 uh, says, And the patriarchs become envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. God is with us even though we have a dysfunctional family. Um, see, Jacob was wrong to show favoritism when he did um, what he did, you know. Also, the, his sons deceived Joseph, uh, Jacob, so they also committed, um, you know, a crime against their father, not only against Joseph, but against their father. And also, you see that Jake, uh, Joseph uh, was loved, you know, he was loved. He knew that he was loved. So he, 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 he got, when he was sold as a slave, he had to humble himself. He had to learn humility. He actually had to learn a lot of things. For example, he had to learn to be a leader. He had to learn to know how to speak. He actually, we'll see in Thursday's lesson, he had to learn to read facial languages, how people's emotions are. He didn't have that before. That's why you couldn't tell that his brothers are angry with him. So, yeah. It wasn't the brightest in common sense. Exactly, exactly, absolutely. So jo jo Joseph had to grow up, and why? Because God you know, is, in the, uh, is working. Alyssa and I were talking earlier about how things could have turned differently, but we all know that God is a puzzle solver. Even though we create yeah. this mess, he puts those pieces together. And that is the story. You know, Mother Teresa has a poem. It says, um, it, the poem is called, Anyways, people are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win. Some false friends and some true enemies succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. See, we are a family. We are dysfunctional. God is calling us to be united. And because of that, he's allowing all this. So even though Joseph was attacked, there was a plan. In behind it. And if we in, in life are going to go through the same thing. And we should realize that Matthew chapter 5 says that whoever is poor in spirit, thirsty, hungry, persecuted, through them, God can work wonders. My question to you and to all the people that are listening, are we ready to take that poor spirit and welcome the trial so that God can use us? Thank you. Amen. Okay, we're moving on to Tuesday's lesson, Judah and Tamar. Oh. Now you might say, where's well, Joseph in here? Yeah. But we see this story, and, and it is odd that it works in, but, you know, mm -hmm. with this lesson with the master of dreams, but it does make sense once we go through it. So we're going to read Genesis 38.1. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite, whose name was Hira. Now, a lot of people say in verse 1 there, when it said it came about that time, that this is after Joseph was sold. Mm -hmm. But if you do the numbers, it doesn't work out. And a lot of scholars believe that this is just their time in Canaan. So, in other words, when they sold him, he was actually probably already married. So, it appears, you know, that in that, 
and that might have been some, one of the reasons why he didn't want to shed blood because he's finally starting to get it. They're all very young. He was more than likely about 14 when he was married or somewhere in there. Yep. So, yes. So we look at that timeline. They spent, 20, since Joseph was sold, they'd spent 22 years in the land of Canaan before they went down to Egypt. It's kind of hard to have all of those children and God kill them off and everything like that in that limited time span. So we see, though, the transformation in Judah. Now we see him stand up to at least to where he doesn't want to kill his brother and they want to sell him. And we'll see a transformation, a larger transformation, in Genesis 43, where he makes a pledge to his father to take care of Benjamin when they do go down to Egypt. And in 44, Genesis 44, when he pleads with Joseph to take him as a slave and let Benjamin go. We see a transformation character, and this whole lesson is about transformation and characters as well. So we see that Judah marries a Canaanite woman, and her name is Shua, and he has three sons by her. The sons are Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Ur is married young, probably about 14 or so, to Tamar. And in Genesis 38, it tells how the Lord killed him because he was wicked. Then Judah has Onan marry Tamar to bring up offspring for his brother. The custom at that time was that a childless, childless widow would marry the next oldest brother-in-law to continue his name. That sounds good, right? Till you look at it. In doing so, then the firstborn male would receive Onan's inheritance. By doing this, Onan gets nothing. And that's why he spills his seed on the ground, which angers the Lord, and he kills Onan as well. He defiled the sacredness of his marriage, and also there's a coveting issue there. So missing out on all that inheritance items and stuff. So this all happened realistically within like a few years. And Judah's running out of children fast. Thinking that Tamar is somehow to blame for his children dying or at least being associated with her, he says that the youngest, Shelah, is not ready to marry yet. He's too young. So Judah sends Tamar to live with her father until Salah is old enough to marry her. Yeah, like that's going to happen. Judah has no intention of risking his last son with this woman. Tamar finally gets it. And there's, no, there's never going to be a marriage to Shelah. Not now and not ever. We read Genesis 38 verses 12 through 14. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep, her sheep shearers at Timnah, and he and his friend Hira, the Adolamite. It was told to Tamar, behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garment and covered herself with a veil. She wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Anam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up, and she had not been given to him as a wife. She's not playing this game. So the sheep shearing, it wasn't just for the wool. It was actually kind of a festivity. The servants were treated very well during that time. It was kind of like a gathering, almost a party, but not quite. And it still actually happens today in that region of the world, um, particularly around the time end of March. So Judah is going with his friend Hira to relax and have some fun now that his days of mourning for his wife have passed. On the way to the fun, he sees some more fun. Not good for Judah, but still, because he knows better. But we read Genesis 38, 15 through 18. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that, I, that you may come in to me? 
He said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and he went into her and she conceived by him. Now I want to actually read from the SDA Bible commentary, page, volume one, page 435 about this. When Shalah had reached a marriage, marriageable age, but was not given to her, Tamar determined to secure a child by Judah himself. This was completely in harmony with prevailing Hittite and Assyrian custom. The laws of the Hittites and Assyrians contained the provision that the duty of leverate marriage was to be performed by the father of the deceased if no brother was available. So apparently the youngest is off limits. So she's like, you know what, Judah? Whether you like it or not, you're going to help me out. <laughs> Remember, she's... Oh, that culture. Their yeah, culture. Sorry. she's okay. from Canaan, yeah, so, so this she, is she, normal to normal her. Normal to him. Okay, very good. And she is not about to be slighted like this by Judah, widowed and childless for the rest of her life. We've seen how big of a deal it is to have children in the Bible. She's not having this. So why did she pick the seal, the cord, and the staff? Well, according to the SDA Bible commentary as well in that same area, the seal and cord were probably a cylinder seal. In other words, it was kind of a, a long cylinder and they would roll it on the clay. It's, it's kind of like your driver's license and your signature all in one. And so, and besides that, and the cord was actually, it would hang around your neck. So literally you kept it near and dear to you. The staff, normally if you were up there as a herdsman, they would have a custom carved or, or ornamented staff. So all of these things can identify him and him alone. It's like giving your driver's license or a photo ID and perhaps a credit card with it. So Tamar is all ready. She has a contingency plan in place. She's ready in case she does become pregnant. And through all of this, we see God's providence. So three months pass and now it's apparent that Tamar is with the child. Genesis 38, 24 through 26. Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed. Your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot and behold, she is with her also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. That is harsh. Even in Moses' time, you stone them. Mm -hmm. Unless it's the mm -hmm. priest's daughter and then they would burn them. So the, Judah was with that culture maybe. Yeah, it's custom one way or another. Culture. We're not yeah. sure, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law saying, I am with child by a man to whom these things belong. And she said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Shalah. And he did not have relations with her again. So Tamar gives birth to twins. And they are Perez and Zerah. Who do, whose lineage does Perez belong to? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Matthew 1, 3. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. And Hezron the father of Ram. So what can we learn from this? First of all, it looks like Judah as having a David moment with the prophet Nathan, where she lets him discover himself. He confesses his sin, though, and it changes him for the better. We see Tamar, who must have been transformed as well. She is one of the f first of the four women married, or, that's actually mentioned in the lineage of Jesus, at least before the Virgin Mary. And you don't get in that group unless you're part of a special club. This is mentioned, in, in, as we said, it's Tamar, I'm sorry, yeah, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. For her to be mentioned in that group is something. So you look at this. This story about Judah and Tamar is about transformation and how Joseph is being transformed, how all of them are being transformed when they see this. And... 
even with Joseph, he's not part of the line of the lineage, but he's preserving it. So on that note, Elisa, yeah. tell us about Joseph, a slave in Egypt. Sure. Okay. Meanwhile, <laughs> in other parts of the world. Um, okay, so we're going to read through uh, chapter 39. This picks up uh, again on Joseph, and he here has been sold as a slave to Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guard. In verse 2 mentions that the Lord was with Joseph and made him successful in his master's house, leading to Joseph's elevation of status. And in verse 3 and 4 we read, And the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him, Joseph, the overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. And verse 5 says that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house, or Potiphar's house, for Joseph's sake. However, trouble was around the corner here. In verse 7, we learn of Potiphar's wife, and she cast longing eyes on Joseph and tried to encourage him to have an adulterous affair with her. In verse 9, we find that Joseph, who is firm in his resolve to obey God and his Egyptian master, tells the woman, there's no one greater than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So this went on for some time. The woman appears to be relentless in her pursuit of Joseph, and she then appears to contrive a plot to trick Joseph when everyone else is out of the house and grabs hold of his clothing. In his eagerness to flee the scene, his garment is torn from him and he leaves it behind. So quite likely, she's now very infuriated and humiliated uh, with, by Joseph, and so because she cannot get what she wants, she turns against him and s spins a hideous lie to ruin him. Verse 14 and 15, the text says, She called to the men of the house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought in to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me and cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. She then tells Potiphar the same story and shows him Joseph's clothing that had been left behind. Potiphar, in his anger, puts Joseph in prison for this alleged crime against his wife. And now this is the prison where the king's prisoners were held, which God will later use to put Joseph in contact with others that will recommend Joseph to Pharaoh as one who can interpret dreams. And we'll learn more about that on Thursday's lesson. But the Lord does not abandon Joseph here, even though the circumstances seem helpless and dire. In verse 21, we read, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So similar story to what had happened in, in Potiphar's home we see the same thing happening in the prison in terms of Joseph's um, role and, and status in those environments. Joseph's character of gentleness, fidelity, and truthfulness, purity of heart, obedience, and devotion to God, which was forged early in his life, were of much value to his Egyptian masters. Even in this overwhelming, difficult, and uncertain circumstances, that Joseph maintained his belief and reliance on God, choosing obedience to God over any pleasure or self-promotion. The Lord then blessed and prospered Joseph, even though he was a slave and in prison. 
And so a couple key points from that that we can reflect on is despite what seemed to be dire and unsurmountable circumstances for Joseph, he was a slave in a foreign land that didn't worship the true God, he remained faithful to God. And that certainly could be a lesson for us as, as we live our lives in, in, in a very pagan world at some times. And another point is God blesses Joseph and those he works for in a most notable way. So not only blessing Joseph, but it says he blessed Potiphar and he blessed the, you know, the prison house, right? And so people are blessed through God's faithful people. Um, this success does not corrupt Joseph, however. And then another point is that even when wrongfully put in prison, Joseph maintained his trust in God. In turn, God prospers Joseph even in the prison in much the same manner as he was in Potiphar's house. So, you know, if, if at any point he could become very discouraged at this point, right, and, and even turn from God saying, how, how did you abandon me, you know? Um, but that was not Joseph's attitude. Right. So Joseph's faith was tested in these trials, and in each trial, Joseph clings to God and obedience to God's law. In Patriarchs and Prophet, chapter 20, um, Ellen G. White writes, The marked prosperity which attended everything placed under Joseph's care was not the result of a direct miracle, but his industry, care, and energy were crowned with the divine blessing. Joseph attributed his success to the favor of God, and even his idolatrous master accepted this as the secret of his unparalleled prosperity. Without steadfast, well-directed effort, however, success could not have been attained. God was glorified in the faithfulness of his servant. It was his purpose that in purity and uprightness, the believer in God should appear in, man, in marked contrast to the worshipers of idols, that thus the light of heavenly grace might shine forth amid the darkness and heathenism. You know, so it is for us today as we go about our work, right? We're not to be lazy and slothful. We're supposed to be productive and diligent in what we do, and God will bless that. But Joseph's faith and integrity were to be tested by fiery trials. What an important lesson that has for us in our duty to God and to men. James 1, 2-4 reads, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And Ellen White further writes, if we were to cherish an habitual impression that God sees and hears all that we do and say and keeps a faithful record of our words and actions and that we must meet it all, we would fear sin. No part of our conduct escapes observation. Joseph suffered for his integrity, but his, for his tempter revenged herself by accusing him of a foul crime and causing him to be thrust into prison. At first, Joseph was treated with great severity by his jailers, but Joseph's real character shines out, even in the darkness of the dungeon. He held fast to his faith and patience, and his years of service had been more than most cruelly repaid, yet this did not render him morose or distrustful. He had the peace that comes from conscious innocence, and he trusted his case with God. God was preparing him in the school of affliction for greater usefulness, and he did not refuse the needed discipline. Amen. If we were so faithful, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's okay. faithful and just, too. Yeah. All right. You want to go to Thursday's lesson? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you, um, you said something that's really amazing, that we are not to sit quietly. Mm -hmm. And um, we are part of God's family. The definition of family is unity, mm -hmm. united. And as we know, that um, the world is not united. And mm -hmm. as such, if we proclaim to be God's people we are always to work to unite. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Or they're united in the wrong thing. <laughs> united in the mm -hmm. anything that's you not united for God right. is not united. That's or right. united for the that's wrong true. thing. Thank you, Baron, for that. So, you know, my uh, Thursday's lesson is the dreams of Pharaoh. And we already know about this dream situation that we're learning in this, um, in this uh, lesson. And we see that the dreams are repeated twice in every scenario. And right now we'll see that there are two dreams here, two dream situations. We have, there are two dreams that happen in the prison, okay, by two different people. And then Pharaoh is going to have two dreams that Jake, uh, Joseph says they're one. Just like his dreams, Joseph's dream was also one because it was talking about the same thing. So in fact, this is, should be easy for Joseph to in, interpret, right? So, uh, <laughs> but he gives all the credit to God. God, yeah, that, is, that is absolutely where things are, that we need to realize that God is giving these prophecies through the dreams. And these prophecies are coming to life. And we can see here in this, in this story how quickly they're coming to life. That's the God we serve that he keeps his promise. Right? right, and the lesson touched on it. We didn't as much, but just the parallels between Daniel and Joseph. Oh, and yes. Especially in this case. So. Ab ab thank you for bringing that up because we'll see the parallel between Joseph, Daniel, Mardukai. Why? Because you see that Joseph was number two in command in Egypt. Daniel was number two in command in Babylon and a little bit in Persia. And then Mardukai, after Esther's story, he was raised to the second in command. So God always uses his people to save the world, bring back his family. So let's see how this is done. Well, we see that Joseph, wherever he goes, he becomes a leader, right? Because he has faith in God. That's the key. Faith in God makes you confident and, be, and people look at us as humble and trustworthy. And that's key. Now, here Joseph uh, takes care of these two people that Pharaoh is angry with, Baker and the cupbearer. And you know the cupbearer is really the most trusted person in a kingdom because he drinks and eats before the king, so the king is never poisoned. And so they're in the prison, and Joseph again becomes the leader and takes care of these royal people, royal prisoners. And here we see how Joseph has grown, Genesis 47. He noticed that the cupbearer and the baker were sad. This time, they couldn't hide their feelings from Joseph like his brothers were able to from him. And you see, this is important. As Christians, you know, we know this world is a very fast-paced world now. And we look at our phone. We don't look around. If you go to New York, you'll see how people just walk. And very few people actually look around and greet. I've been there. So California is a very beautiful place in that sense. However, See, if Joseph doesn't look at these people, these two person, and see that they're sad, he misses an opportunity. He misses the opportunity to interpret their dream. He misses the opportunity to go to Pharaoh and become number two in command. Just remember that God, doesn't, God gives us opportunities everywhere. We just need to remember to look for it. So here, he hears that, and then, you know, those people are sad, and they say, oh, nobody can interpret this. And Joseph says, only God can. Just let me hear it. Let me hear it. You know, it's not me. God is going to tell me. So then he uh, hears the message, the dream from the uh, cupbearer. And the cupbearer, mm, his dream was a good dream, right? It's a, it's a vine and then three branches. There's, uh, the branches are full of grapes. And then he gets his cup back. And then he uh, gives the king the juices, grape juices from the cup. So uh, Joseph says, well, it's a great dream. You know, you're going to be restored in three days. But remember... When you are with the king, please rem remember me. Tell the king that. What's interesting is that Joseph telling this cupbearer, but the cupbearer forgets. Another sign that divine intervention is at work. Because if the cupbearer goes and tells Pharaoh, it's Joseph telling. But he forgets, and later on, God reminds the cupbearer what has early. happened. Yes, it's too early. Very, very, very well, they said. And so, this, so what happens? They forget. We forget. You know, we also need to, uh, one lesson here is we need to learn to appreciate what people did for us, you know. No, we never do that. Once we're out of trouble, we yeah. forget all that stuff and get on with our lives. Yes, you know, and uh, like um, Alicia said, that Potiphar was blessed because of Joseph, right? Because he appreciated him. So we need to appreciate people. Now, yeah. two years pass by, nothing is happening. Suddenly, Pharaoh has these two dreams. And the two dreams are the same. Um, uh, seven cows that are healthy and seven cows that are unhealthy. 
then you have a stock with seven heads that are healthy and stock with seven heads that are unhealthy. And what happens is the healthy, unhealthy cows eat the healthy cows and unhealthy, uh, ugly uh, stock with the head eats the healthy stock with the head. And, Joseph, and then Pharaoh just wakes up and his heart is troubled. He's telling all these magicians, nobody can tell him. Is that the same parallel with Nebuchadnezzar right. and Daniel, right? No, nobody can say. So finally, Kaber uh, remembers, obviously by the Holy Spirit. And then uh, he tells, the, uh, tells um, Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh show, does something here. Mrs. Ellen White says that Pharaoh humbles himself. And it, and it says in, in, in this chapter that they always mention that he's a Hebrew. He is not one of the Egyptians. They make a point of that. So what that means is that Pharaoh had to humble himself to go to a slave, a Hebrew person, to get the dream. And he did just that. Pharaoh did humble himself. And so Joseph comes, and then Pharaoh asks, uh, tells him that, yeah, they tell me that you can interpret dream. Guess what? Joseph again gives glory to God. And he says, God can give you peace. He says, I can interpret and all this, or you know, God can interpret, but more important than that, God can give you peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds, right? And so that's what's going on. So uh, again here, Joseph says two dreams are one. That means God said it's going to happen soon. It's sure to happen. It's, it's like Jesus says, verily, verily, when he repeats, important. Let's go and find this verily, verily as many times as we can in the Bible. That will help us. So here he tells, the, you know, he tells Pharaoh what's going to happen. Now, what's interesting is, uh, let's go to Genesis 41, uh, 33. Genesis 41, uh, 33. It says, um, I, I like this. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. So here he interprets the dream, but he doesn't stop there. What is the turning point here is that Joseph actually starts giving advice. You know, he was always had that personality of giving advice. How do we know that? Because his dad sends him to give a report of his brothers. He sends them again. Wherever he goes, he becomes a leader. How do you become a leader? We know uh, when we are at work, people want report. So what we're doing and communication, go ahead. He's learned to do it tactfully now. Tactfully, much different because yes. he has grown. So now here, Joseph, instead of saying, oh, hire me, Right. He says, you know what? We need somebody wise and discerning. The, and then he tells uh, how to do it. He says one-fifth of the produce. God wants one-tenth. He's talking about double portion, one-fifth. Okay? And, uh, and, and then Pharaoh says, wow, you know, I don't know who can do this. So let's go to 41, Genesis 41, 38 to 41. It says, and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one? as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and, as, uh, and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your what? Word. Actually, is it Joseph's word or is it God's word? Because God's God, word. Joseph always gives glory to God, right? So it's God's Same. Same with Daniel. They couldn't find a fault with him. Yep. So, and they can't find a fault with Joseph, Joseph. either. The only two people in the Bible that it, they had sin, but they don't mention any of it. No. Nope. Yep. Amazing. So. Thank you, Byron. That is a good point. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you all over the land of Egypt. Jesus said, unless you become the lowest, you can become the greatest. What a, what a transformation. I mean, when I see this, I'm like... This is God doing the whole time. I mean, you know, and, and, and as you can see, there's some interesting things. Like I said, you know, just earlier that uh, like Daniel, uh, Joseph is like Daniel, just like Mordecai. In fact, because of Joseph, the whole world was saved, right? Because the, it was severe famine. Why? Because Joseph relied on God and not on his own power. And uh, Patriarchs and Prophets says, through Joseph, the attention of the king and the great men of Egypt were directed to the true God. And then let me read this. In Christian experience, the Lord permits trials of various kinds to call men and women to a higher order of living and to a more sanctified service. You see, God never, never works, uh, never stops working 
to restore what he started is a family and that's what he is doing and we are dysfunctional we are, can be violent but we need to know that envy needs to be stopped and that is the key and that is what this is all about so we just have to thank god how he does miracles in our life thank you amen yeah. Yeah. elisa you yeah have any final thoughts yeah I, I i do so this is this is a very interesting family yeah um as we just discussed you know joseph is the first one in the family where the bible doesn't record any sin yeah. of his yeah. right. you know and when when we look at abraham isaac jacob we saw where they failed in their faith as they walked on their journey. Mm -hmm. And if you recall back when, when the Lord came to Abraham right before he went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and to pronounce judgment, he again repeated that you will have this cherished son. And Sarah was in the hearing. And the, you know they had been up and down in their faith and the Lord said to them, is anything of the Lord too hard for the Lord, right? Yep. Joseph was the first one in the family to really live that. Yep, yep. Much wow. like we see later in Christ, yep. how Christ always referred to the Father, believed in the Father, was our example. We see the foreshadowing of this faith, you know, in, in Joseph. And um, that's available to you and I. Yeah right that's available yeah. to each one of us and it's a it's it's a, a choice joseph believed god and he didn't lose faith through all these trials and he maintained his faith in god and we can do the same absolutely yeah, yeah baron i just wanted to quickly mention that all these trials that we have god is making us to have a wise and right. discernible heart all the family members of god must search that wise and discernible mm -hmm. heart. Yeah, he's yes. refining us like yeah. the gold of Ophir yeah. and mm -hmm. getting those little burrs off of us too <laughs> that, that mess up our character. Yeah. I'd like to read something from um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 222. There are few who realize the influence of the little things of life upon the development of character. Nothing with which we have to do is really small. In other words, everything matters. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and to qualify us for greater trust. By adherence to principle and the transactions of ordinary life, the mind becomes accustomed to hold the claims of duty above those of pleasure and inclination. Minds thus disciplined are not wavering between right and wrong. Like a reed trembling in the wind, they are loyal to duty because they have trained themselves to habits of fidelity and truth. That would be that transformation that we've seen all lesson long. By faithfulness and that which is least, they acquire strength to be faithful in greater matters. How many times do we see that in the Bible? Even with the talents, mm -hmm. the parable of the talents. So how are we doing in the little trials of life? Do we know right from wrong? What did Pastor Joseph, what was his sermon? The test before the test? Yeah. Mm. You know, and that test before the test determines how you will do. Are we being molded into his likeness, that's Christ's likeness, each and every day? Because at some point in time, as we covered in last week's lesson, the time of Jacob's trouble will come upon us as well in this life. And if we're not faithful in the little things, we don't stand a chance in the bigger things to come. So I pray that each one of us can be like Joseph, rooted in the simplicity to God, no matter what the world may be around us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, with humble, contrite hearts. We look to you as the solution for everything. Just as Joseph looked to you, Lord, we see how he had a life more so of privilege and then how in one day everything changed into slavery. We see how you lifted him up until he went to prison 
And just as he was in shackles and treated horribly, just like Paul and Silas were in prison, Lord, we see you in those people. And that faithfulness that grows from little things to more to more. We pray, Lord, that each one of us might be faithful in the little things. That we might grow talents for you, Lord. That we might transform characters to reflect the image of the living God. That in the day of trouble, Lord, we too might stand firm with the armor of God and Christ and Christ alone. Lord, we can never do it by ourselves. It's only with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us that we even have a chance. And with you, Lord, and your word, as we discuss, your word never fails. I pray and ask, Lord, that each person watching might be rooted in you. Each person might start their day with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As Paul said, that Die, that we die to self that Christ may live and that, Lord, each person might represent the living God so well in this world that we, just as Joseph shined to Potiphar and other people in Egypt, that we might shine as the sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you and praise your glorious name, our Father in heaven, the Son, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.